In May 2018, Gina Haspel's nomination as director of the CIA was in trouble. Democrats in the US Senate said they wouldn't confirm her. President Donald Trump wavered in his support. Haspel herself considered withdrawing. The problem wasn't Haspel's qualifications. She'd worked for the CIA since 1985, compiling an impressive record of field service and executive experience. Also, many welcomed the nomination of a woman to a post that so far had been held only by men. The issue, rather, was Haspel's past involvement in a highly controversial CIA program. The enhanced interrogation, or torture, as many critics said, of suspected terrorists detained after 9-11. Shortly after the terror attacks, Gina Haspel commanded a CIA facility in Thailand, where enhanced interrogations took place, including the widely denounced practice of waterboarding. Later, she participated in the destruction of videotapes of interrogations. The interrogation program had since shut down, but it remained in the public eye thanks to a lengthy investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee, which itself had become a focus of controversy when it emerged that the CIA was spying on Senate staffers. During the May 2018 confirmation hearings, Haspel reassured senators that as CIA director, she would disobey any presidential order to reintroduce enhanced interrogation but she resisted being drawn into denouncing the earlier program as immoral, and she refused to accept the Senate Intelligence Committee's conclusion that the interrogations had failed to produce any useful intelligence. For many Democrats, this was not good enough. A few Republicans were unhappy as well. These included the terminally ill Senator John McCain of Arizona, a survivor of torture during the Vietnam War. Senator McCain issued a statement from hospital encouraging others to vote against Haspel's confirmation. In the end, thanks in part to a concerted public relations campaign by the CIA itself, enough Democrats shifted their support to Haspel that she won the confirmation vote 54 to 45. She was sworn in as director of the CIA on May 21st, 2018. Now, the dispute surrounding Gina Haspel's confirmation illustrated not only the endearingly controversial nature of the CIA's interrogation program, it was also an example of a fundamental contradiction that lies at the very heart of the agency's existence and which provides a central theme of this course. The ongoing tension between democracy and public accountability on the one hand and secret government power on the other. As we'll see throughout this course, the pendulum has swung back and forth between these principles throughout the CIA's history. During the first years of the agency's existence, in the late 1940s and 1950s, Congress and the US media pretty much left the government's intelligence services alone to carry on the nation's Cold War fight against communism. Later, in the 1960s and 70s, public support for the Cold War faded and the CIA faced an environment of heightened public scrutiny, even hostility. Later still, in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan rebooted the Cold War and the CIA enjoyed a revival of its reputation and secret powers. This truce with Congress and the media was fragile, however. After 9-11, revelations about intelligence failures and covert excesses like the enhanced interrogation program ignited a new round of controversies. Now, I'm painting with broad strokes. That's because I want to give you some sense of the larger picture of CIA history before I focus on specific events. Something else I want to make clear is that I'm not going to come down strongly on one side of the debate or the other. In case you haven't guessed from my accent, I grew up in England. And although I've been living in the United States for several years now, I still have a bit of an outsider perspective that I think helps make my approach to the CIA fairly objective. I should also explain that although I've researched and written about the history of the CIA for years and interviewed lots of former spies, I don't have a background in intelligence myself. Uh, not unless you count a grandfather who did some mysterious work for the British government during World War II. 
When people ask what got me interested in this subject, I tell them that like a lot of people, I've always been fascinated by spies and spying. I'm just lucky that I get to study the CIA for a living. In any case, my overall aim in this course is not to tell you what to think, but rather to provide you with the evidence for you to decide. Has the CIA fulfilled its difficult mission as the secret intelligence service of the world's largest democracy? In this first lecture, I'll concentrate on the origins of the CIA. In particular, I'm going to try to answer the question, why did the United States feel it necessary to create a secret foreign intelligence service? After all, this is a nation that's never been entirely comfortable with government secrecy, nor for that matter, with involvement in foreign affairs. In tackling this question, I'm going to cover three main periods of US government intelligence before the birth of the CIA in 1947. First, from the era of the American Revolution to the late 1930s. Second, during the years of World War II and the wartime Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, the CIA's most obvious predecessor. And finally, the period immediately after the war, from 1945 to 1947. As you'll see, the tension between secrecy and democracy isn't unique to the CIA. It's as old as the United States itself. The first point to make about the creation of the CIA is that it happened relatively late. The spy services of other major powers date back to the early 1900s. Great Britain's MI6, for example, and the Soviet Cheka, a predecessor to the KGB. France's Deuxième Bureau can be traced to the 1870s. There are several good reasons for this. Two vast oceans naturally defended the United States so that it didn't need intelligence about possible threats to its security in the same way that the Europeans did. By and large, America lacked foreign enemies or overseas possessions that it had to defend. Finally, its people didn't like the idea of secret government power. Espionage and covert operations were dirty tricks, something undertaken by the corrupt imperial governments of the old world, not the virtuous young republic of the United States. Still, for all the Americans' dislike of spies and spying, there were times of national emergency when the country did resort to secret intelligence. Usually, this was when the nation was at war, and its leaders felt an urgent need to find out what the enemy was thinking and planning for military purposes. Uh, this might involve sending spies into the enemy camp to eavesdrop on conversations. Or more sophisticated means, like the interception of military signals traffic. Whatever the technology, this was espionage. Gathering information by secret, and as far as the enemy was concerned, illegal means. But secret intelligence work might also go beyond espionage to include covert action that is, clandestine operations designed to hurt enemies. This could involve sabotaging their supplies, or deceiving them about troop movements, or demoralizing them by spreading false or doctored information. Theoretically, espionage and covert operations could be carried out by separate units, but in practice, they've tended historically to be housed in the same organization. Despite Americans' traditionally anti-spy perspective, they've always used espionage and covert action in moments of crisis, starting with the founding of the nation. Early in the American Revolution, George Washington set up a committee to communicate secretly with sympathizers abroad. He also regularly sent spies into British-occupied territory in the colonies. Indeed, one of the first martyrs of the American cause was a spy. The British caught young Nathan Hale on a secret mission on Long Island and hung him on a street corner in Manhattan. Hale's last words became a famous early statement of American patriotism. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Washington also practiced what today would be called counterintelligence, rooting out British spies within the American camp. Benjamin Tolmadge, uh, head of the Culper Spy Ring in New York, helped to catch the notorious American traitor Benedict Arnold. And a further precursor to the present day, 
Both sides in the Revolutionary War use codes to communicate and try to break those of each other. The Americans' eventual victory over the British was due in part to a classic deception operation. Fake American dispatches fell into the hands of British spies, and British General Charles Cornwallis was trapped at Yorktown. Still, for all the importance of espionage and covert action during the American Revolution, citizens of the Young Republic never really took spying to heart. It's telling that the secret agent most remembered from this period wasn't the brave young patriot Nathan Hale, it was the turncoat Benedict Arnold. After the Revolution, other founding fathers besides Washington, most notably Thomas Jefferson, tried to create a permanent secret service for the New Republic, but nothing lasting resulted. This pattern of intelligence growing in importance during time of war and fading again after the return of peace repeated itself throughout American history. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln hired the private detective Alan Pinkerton to provide security for the Union side and to gather information on the Confederacy. Pinkerton was a fascinating personality with many talents as an intelligence chief, including a flair for publicity. After the war, he earned headlines by going after the famous outlaws Frank and Jesse James. However, this adventure backfired when Pinkerton agents wounded the bandit's mother and killed their young half-brother. This incident, combined with the Pinkertons' involvement in the bloody labor battles of the late 1800s, contributed to Americans' dim view of the spy profession, even after the Union victory. Now, the World War I era did see the US government enter further into the intelligence business than it ever had before. The State Department created an elite Central Intelligence Unit called U-1. A colorful character named Herbert Yardley ran a code-breaking operation known as the Black Chamber. And in 1924, a young detective by the name of J. Edgar Hoover became director of the Bureau of Investigation, later the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The government appeared to be gradually taking over the business of national security from private agencies like the Pinkertons. The moment didn't last, however. As Americans retreated into isolationism after World War I, the anti-spy tradition came roaring back. The government closed down U-1 and the Black Chamber. Secretary of State Henry Stimson summed up the general attitude toward intelligence work in 1929 when he declared, Gentlemen, do not read each other's mail. This was the background to the approach of World War II and one of the greatest intelligence shocks in American history, Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, there are several theories as to why exactly Washington missed signs of the imminent Japanese attack in December 1941. But most historians agree that two factors were crucial. One was a failure by politicians to imagine that the Japanese were capable of such an attack. The other was a lack of specific intelligence pointing toward the precise timing and place of the raid. Whatever its exact causes, Pearl Harbor would have huge consequences for the subsequent development of US intelligence. First, it created a strong argument for those advocating a permanent intelligence agency that will function in peacetime as well as war, and therefore be able to wa warn the nation of surprise attacks. Of course, the downside of this would be that if there were another surprise attack, as in September 2001, the permanent intelligence agency would get the blame. Second, and more immediately, Pearl Harbor brought the United States into World War II, and in doing so, it dealt a huge blow to the isolationist, anti-spy habits of mind that had previously slowed the growth of American intelligence. We now enter the second phase of US intelligence history, that of the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. If any single individual could be called the father of the CIA, it's William Wild Bill Donovan. Who was Bill Donovan? Well, unlike many of his contemporaries in the intelligence world, Donovan was not upper class by birth. But he was handsome, brave, and, well, fortunate. 
Born in 1883 to Irish immigrant parents in Buffalo, New York, Donovan studied hard and earned a place at Columbia University. There he won a prize for oratory, starred as quarterback on the football field, and befriended future president Franklin Roosevelt. Upon graduation, Donovan practiced corporate law, and he served heroically in France during World War I, earning several wounds and a croix de guerre. Later, after returning to his law practice, he built up a small fortune and launched himself on a career in politics. Now, it was at this point that Donovan's luck seemed to desert him. A bid for the New York governorship in 1932 fizzled out, and he drifted for several years, unsure of his next step. One way he filled his time during this period was indulging a growing love of foreign adventure, especially secret adventure. His friend Franklin Roosevelt was now president, and Roosevelt sent him on a series of semi-official covert missions to Europe and Asia. In 1940, FDR dispatched Donovan to London to assess Britain's chances of surviving a Nazi invasion. During his visit, Donovan had extraordinary access to British intelligence, and he began to formulate a plan for an American secret service modeled largely on MI6. When Donovan returned to the United States with this plan, he encountered opposition from J. Edgar Hoover, who saw it as a threat to the FBI. The State Department and military intelligence units, such as the Office of Naval Intelligence and the Army's G2, also opposed the idea. But it didn't matter. The president shared Donovan's regard for the British and wanted to prepare the country for the war that was surely coming. In the summer of 1941, Roosevelt appointed Donovan the Coordinator of Information, a sort of intelligence supremo, with historically unprecedented powers over the existing civilian and military agencies. After Pearl Harbor, the function was renamed the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, and the United States had its first Central Intelligence Agency. What to say about Wild Bill Donovan's Office of Strategic Services and its wartime record? Well, there's been a lot of myth-making about the OSS's contribution to the Allied war effort. In fact, the spy service was excluded from several major theatres of the conflict, including all of the Americas, which J. Edgar Hoover claimed for the FBI. The OSS also had to deal with the constant suspicion of the State Department and the military intelligence agencies. And while Donovan was an inspirational leader of the men and women under his command, he was a terrible administrator. One subordinate compared his management style to a man pouring molasses from a barrel onto the table. The OSS became involved in some ludicrous schemes. For example, a plot to drive Hitler insane with lust by showering his headquarters with pornography. But for all its organizational chaos and silly ideas, the OSS had a fine overall war record. Its special operations branch ran guerrilla campaigns in occupied territory that inspired local resistance movements and distracted the enemy. These included the Jedbers, uh, teams of American and British officers who parachuted behind German lines to help French resistance fighters cut Nazi supply lines ahead of the Normandy landings. Then there was the quiet heroism of the staff in the Washington-based research and analysis branch. These were intellectuals and scholars, including, I'm proud to say, many historians, who worked day and night to supply military commanders with battlefield intelligence. Finally, the overseas stations of the secret intelligence branch also achieved a number of notable espionage successes, including establishing contact with the German officers who plotted to assassinate Hitler in 1944. To sum up the OSS's World War II performance, Bill Donovan had several obvious shortcomings, but these shouldn't distract from the fact that he succeeded almost overnight at creating a dynamic, courageous, and imaginative intelligence organization, one that it's possible to argue contributed significantly to the eventual Allied victory, at the very least, that proved a considerable nuisance to the enemy. The Office of Strategic Services was also important historically as the forerunner of the CIA. How so? 
In what ways did the OSS shape the character of the CIA? I'll return to each of these points in a later lecture, so I won't dwell on them long for now. But first, there was the obvious factor that many people who served in the OSS went on to serve in the CIA, including no fewer than four directors of central intelligence. Second, the OSS had a distinctly Ivy League, Anglophile, even aristocratic air to it. According to some, OSS stood not for Office of Strategic Services, but rather for oh so social. And this social identity carried over into the CIA, at least during the agency's early years. This would give the new intelligence organization a strong sense of social cohesion and esprit de corps. But it would also earn the mistrust of those who were suspicious of elites and foreign influences. And it didn't help that the OSS and CIA were the creations of democratic presidents. Many conservatives saw them as outgrowths of liberal big government, endangering American freedoms. Finally, the OSS prefigured the CIA in that it housed intelligence work and covert action under one roof. In some ways, this was a logical arrangement. Intelligence and covert action were both, by definition, secret missions, so it made sense to lump them together. But there was also an implicit tension between intelligence, which involved observing and describing the world, and covert action, which meant trying to change the world. This wasn't necessarily a problem so long as the two missions were given equal weight. But Bill Donovan's natural inclination was toward covert action rather than intelligence work. This preference would be inherited by the CIA with sometimes unfortunate consequences. The CIA wasn't born yet, however. After World War II ended in 1945, the familiar pattern of the US government pulling back from intelligence work during peacetime appeared again. Bill Donovan tried to fight the tide. He lobbied the White House with a plan for a permanent civilian intelligence agency. But opponents in Congress and the media attacked the proposal. They complained it would mean more big government and compared it to the Nazi secret police, the Gestapo. The isolationist Chicago Tribune ran the headline, New Deal plans to spy on world and home folks and super Gestapo agency is under consideration. It's possible that FDR might have supported his friend Donovan, but the president died in April 1945 and his successor, Harry Truman, turned out to share the concerns of Donovan's critics. He actually used the term Gestapo several times himself. Furthermore, the Missouri Democrat Truman personally disliked Donovan, who was an ex-Wall Street Republican. In September 1945, the president ordered the breakup of the OSS and Donovan found himself back on Wall Street practicing corporate law again. Post-World War II America, it seemed, would be no place for spies. So, what changed between 1945 and 1947? Well, for a start, Harry Truman's mind. The post-war world was a confusing, threatening place, especially for a president with little experience in foreign affairs. Also, Truman didn't much care for the lengthy and he felt patronizing briefings he was getting from career foreign service officers in the State Department. So in January 1946, Truman established a new body, the Central Intelligence Group, not agency yet, to provide him with daily foreign intelligence digests, a sort of White House news desk. To run this body, Truman turned to a trusted friend and fellow Midwesterner, Rear Admiral Sidney Sears. The two men performed a mock ceremony in the Oval Office. The President presented Sears with a black cape and wooden dagger and declared him Director of Centralized Snooping. This was a big step forward, but the Central Intelligence Group still had no intelligence gathering capability of its own and no powers of covert action. Truman's timing proved just right because the international environment really began to deteriorate again in 1946. And now you get the second and main reason why the CIA was created, the start of the Cold War. The two post-war superpowers, the United States and Soviet Union, failed to reach an agreement on how to deal with various countries in Eastern Europe after the war. 
The Soviets wanted them firmly within Moscow's sphere of influence to act as a buffer zone against possible future foreign aggressors. The Americans wanted them independent, part of a new international order that implicitly favored US interests. From this initial disagreement, superpower tensions escalated at an alarming speed. Each move by one side seemed to increase the other's feelings of insecurity. Gradually, a new pattern of conflict emerged, in which the two nations used any means short of direct military conflict to check the other. It was a cold war rather than a hot war. Superpower tensions came to a head in 1947. In March of that year, President Truman went before Congress to announce what became known as the Truman Doctrine. This was a new foreign policy committing the United States to defending smaller nations threatened by Soviet takeover. Truman didn't explicitly mention the Soviet Union, but it's pretty clear that's what he meant. That June, Secretary of State George Marshall proposed US assistance to rebuild the war-shattered economies of Western Europe. The Marshall Plan was another escalation of the Cold War. Then, in July, Truman signed the National Security Act, creating the Central Intelligence Agency and much of the modern US national security apparatus. Unlike the earlier Central Intelligence Group, the CIA had its own independent powers of intelligence gathering and the ability to perform undefined other functions and duties related to intelligence. These words would soon be interpreted to mean covert operations. Decades after the other great powers, the United States had its own permanent intelligence service at last. To sum up, the United States had a long history of espionage and covert action prior to the birth of the CIA in 1947. However, Americans also entertained a strong suspicion of international involvement and excessive government power. It wasn't until the extraordinary conditions of the 1940s, when a hot world war was swiftly followed by a cold one, that advocates of intelligence and internationalism overcame the anti-spy tradition. The CIA, for roughly the first two decades of its existence, would have an unprecedented amount of operational freedom. But even during the summer of 1947, there were some who hesitated before creating a peacetime intelligence agency. One Republican congressman protested that no president should have a Gestapo of his own. An isolationist newspaper went so far as to warn about the dangers of creating a super-duper Gestapo OSS cloak and dagger organization. And this fear of the government's potential to abuse its secret powers would return to haunt the CIA throughout its existence, right down to the present day. Mm -hmm.